Good evening. I'm Janice Dempsey. Together with my husband, Donald Dempsey, we publish poetry as Dempsey and Windle um, with a, an imprint called, which is called Vol. Um, this month we've, uh, we've um, launched a new collection of poems by Richard Schwartz called The Political Economy of Tango in the 21st Century. Um, it was launched on the 4th of March 2021, which was yesterday. Um, unfortunately, I didn't switch the recording on for my own introduction. So this is in place of that. Um, I think you all know Richard quite well. So I, it, you haven't missed very much, it, not hearing my uh, biography of him, um, but you should watch the launch. It is very, very good. Um, John Apple, Zimbabwean poet par excellence, um, was able to be our guest reader, along with David Blyman, who also read some of Richard's poems as well as his own. And um, it was a lovely evening. So go ahead, watch it, have a glass of wine, imagine you were there. Um, I'm now going to read a couple of family related poems. Um, the first one is called JJSZL. And ZL, for those who are not familiar with the term, is a, is a Hebrew term, Zichronel of Rocha, which means may their memory be for a blessing. And it's usually abbreviated to Z double apostrophe L. Um, in just a few weeks, he'd have made 97. Toasted with a whiskey, most likely red label, and blood sugar tested, a small slice of cake. Instead, he fell short by years. His sudden collapse at the back of the queue, head to the hard cafe floor, startled staff and patrons alike. Not really his nature to make a palaver. An ambulance arrived, its crew revived his damaged heart. We followed them to the hospital. Summoned family watched him wind down. Driving to his sister west along the motorway, clouds edge red and orange. Look, the sky, says Ethan, for that's grandpa going up to heaven. Um, and now, this is something a lot of people experience with a little bit of distance from um, uh, family bereavements. Do you ever find yourself before a mirror shaving, for example, or glancing and passing at your own reflection as you amble to the kitchen for a fresh mug of tea and a biscuit, when, clearly staring back, you see a member of the family peering through your own eyes at how you're getting on. First your gran, then your old man, faces etched into your own, likeness in a scowl, smile in a twist of the mouth. We've given you our skin to grow old in. Wear it as you wish. We'll hold back our advice, useful as we think you'd find it. And there's a, a you probably know a poet called Billy Collins, an American poet. He was a uh, poet laureate for a while in the States. Um, and he once said something like, most inspirations for poems come from staring out the window. Uh, and this is one of mine. Uh, I'm looking out, or my desk looks out on a common, which was very nice. There's a fair amount of human traffic. 
And this also has a family aspect, as you'll see. Out the window. At my desk, gazing through the window, out across the common, mother's wheeling buggies stroll into frame, heading north, chatting, unperturbed by weather. Two clad cyclists pedal south to work or maybe to the river. All seems right with their world. They'll deal as they find. Grandma used to say, we should make the most of things, that God helps those who help themselves. Also, that her siblings and their spouses were a bunch of bloody shits, though not when my mother was in earshot. And now moving from, um, that's not the one I, yeah. Um, sticking with the family, but not my family. Um, there is, uh, this is called a father's advice and the inspiration is in Hamlet, uh, Polonius gives some, advice to Laertes before he goes abroad. And somehow Shakespeare, even with the characters that he belittles for most of his plays or, or doesn't present in a good light, he gives them a few good lines. And this, uh, this was the case with Polonius and, and Hamlet. Um, and and uh, that was the inspiration for this. It's called A Father's Advice. You're closer to the corner than you think. Soon choices will need to be made. Best keep your eyes peeled. Watch the road. Check for the unexpected coming up on the inside lane. Consider all your options. If less than certain what to do, to turn or not to turn, just fake it. Look determined. When others scowl or remonstrate, rise to the occasion. Make the crudest gesture you know. Curse. Greek or Afrikaans is best. This above all, to thine own self be forgiving. These few precepts be your guide. Um, and now to a poem about the personal experience of getting old, which uh, some may relate to. It's called Surprising What We Get Used To. First was the hair, follicles deciding for themselves they need more room to breathe, losing interest in the common good, no longer all for one and one for all. Then the eyes choosing where to focus, leaving it at that, restless in the face of correction. Now the skin has its own ideas, cultivates landscapes. The ears, I believe, will be next in line. Of course, I can still hear fine, even if I don't always listen. Um, how are we doing for time, Janice? Okay. Um, You've had about 10 minutes so far. Okay. So if you want to go on for another five, that would be good. Okay, great. So this poem is also about getting old, but it's got a slight COVID tinge to it from the context. Um, it's called, This is What It Must Be Like. This is what it must be like to be retired, leaving the flat to take out the rubbish and recycling, assuming the bins have room. Bondi vet until the time comes to rise from the chair, reheat coffee, Read the news you just heard on TV, hoping for an extra fact or two, 
Distracted by Scrabble, played when it must be played. Eyes on the clock in case you forget to do that thing you just forgot. And uh, let me see if I can get in a couple more before the break. Um, I seem to have failed to mark the next one. So hold on one sec, let me just uh, find it. Yeah. This is a somewhat optimistic poem. I'll come to some more pessimistic ones after the break. Um, it's called Coffee United. When, as an encore, Chris Christopherson sings Help Me Make It Through the Night, he is not addressing coffee, though it might be in the back of his mind. In 1553, or thereabouts, however, Rabbi David ben Solomon ibn Abi Zimra, also known as the Radbaz, issued a responsa, likely penned in Egypt, that coffee did not break any rules, given how it helped you study Torah, focus late into the night. Meanwhile, in 1522, the Grand Mufti Mehmed Ebersud El Imadi, also known as El Imadi, issued a fatwa that the beverage could be imbibed, similar reasons applying. I like to think of circumstance ever threw the two together. One of them, to overcome the first few awkward moments of unexpected intimacy, would, to break the ice, have started with that. And maybe I'll just do one more before I hand back um, to Janice. Uh, Since I mentioned Hamlet earlier, uh, this one's called Hamlet's Masterclass. I've witnessed bad decisions shaped in anger, some my own, which is okay. We all have those days. The problem comes with execution. Some say strike when the iron is hot. My take is better not. It can't hurt to think again show patience for the moment. Don't hesitate to hesitate. What might seem tardy is but thorough. Hold back, trust me, blind, th blind thrusts rarely bring the best results. Next week, how not to overthink, or maybe something else, depending. And with that, I will hand back to Janice to introduce David. Thank you very much, Richard. It's lovely to hear poems brought to life by being read. We love this. Um, yes, that was a lovely reading. And um, I think I think that last one was very, very good, very accurate. One should always wait and see, I think. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about David Blyman now. Um, David, compares his own family to a sweep of swallows, migrating between the southern and northern hemispheres every generation. Born in Cape Town, raised in London, he has lived in Scotland since 1979. Writing across the languages, David won the Scots Language Society's Sangshaw Prize last year for The Trebler's Tale, written in a Scots-Yiddish dialect, which as it had died out by the 1950s, he largely had to imagine. Another Scots poem, Why Do You Scream in Scots? Excuse my accent. Was shortlisted. I, mind. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have one when I was about 12, a Scottish accent. Um, was shortlisted by, for the Whig Town Prize in 2020. Also shortlisted for Wigtown was a pamphlet which, revised and extended, is to be published by Dempsey and Windle on May Day, 1st of May, under the title This Kilt of Many Colours, 
So thank you, David. I think you're going to read one or two from Richard's book and also some of your own. Yes. To hearing them. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. This might be the moment for a, a comfort break if anybody's urgently needing. Um, but, uh, well, it's interesting, Richard has already referred to the concept of out the window and we see him in his bedroom, which in my imagination had been a study, but uh, in his bedroom, uh, able to look out of the window at the common, uh, the cyclists and parents pushing prams. Yet, reading Richard's um, collection, it's quite apparent that all these days on which he is looking out the window, he's also looking inside, looking at his own memory and family history. And I'll start by reading the poem that for me best sums this up. And like Richard, I feel badly in need of a page turner. Uh, so this one is called Why When Staring Out. Why when staring out across the common, late damp twilight of a working day, early London winter in the air, do aged nostrils reimagine burning grass, yellow black, smoke below a blue flat, a fat blue sky, cumulus sculptures a hemisphere away, foot on the pedal of a black rudge bike, soot specks on a khaki shirt, dry heat, slow breath, unschooled, in late damp twilights, early London winters in the air. Aged nostrils, I can relate to that. In Richard's case, the dreams and memories playing the tricks that memories do are of Zimbabwe. And so the next one of Richard's I want to read is called Zimbabwe Dreaming. Zimbabwe Dreaming sounds like metal rain on an intercity bus. We don't know how to play it, but it knows how to play us. It's the recollection shuffle. We might even hum along, substitute our stories for what's really going on. My brief tonight was to read a couple of Richard's poems. Well, I've done that, haven't I? Um, but as you can see, uh, Richard has that quality which many of us lack, the craft and courage to be short and sweet. As my mum would say, don't make a matzo pudding of it. So I have plenty more of Richard's work to come. And my next one is a short reflection on the act of writing poetry. This is called Last Word. Sometimes you have to coax a poem out of the shadows with a promise of change and the patience of a saint. Other times it's ahead of you, hot to trot, waiting by the door for your final approval, just wanting to be sure its face is clean, its socks match, and it doesn't have egg on its tie. Uh, I reckon that poets like to write about writing poetry, though we all say, in the words of another of Richard's poems, as a general rule, I don't write about writing, but... So here's one from my own pamphlet, This Kilt of Many Colours, uh, uh, which has, has already been advertised by Janice, is due out with Dempsey and Windle in May. Um, a bit of the backstory may help. I joined a poetry group in March of 2020 and found that several members of the group were so demoralised by the COVID crisis that they were forever complaining that they, quotes, had no words. So this is my sort of pep talk, but it's also inspired by a documentary on the history of writing from which I learned that our modern alphabet goes right back to Egyptian hieroglyphics. For example, that the capital A is the upturned hieroglyph of a bull's head, the horns facing down. Divorced from its meaning for the Egyptians, the Canaanites, who I think were to be migrant workers in Egypt, used the upturned hieroglyph uh, as a symbol for a sound. So this poem is called Alphabet. You say, I have no words. 
begin with pictures on papyrus. Upend this bull's head, call it Aleph. Take this house and call it Beit. Mark this eye and sound out I. Make your words. You have learned to draw such dreams out of despair. Your phrasing of each living line gives form and force to what I feel and wish I had a way to say. So take this reed and make your mark. A paper cut stings more than a knife. I feel your pain of bloody words, your Wortschmerz spelling Weltschmerz. Your words open wounds, open worlds. The anthem of our age begins with something in your eye. I have no words. Um, I want to turn now to one of Richard's poems uh, and another of my own, in which recollection turns to a darker past, a past which casts a long shadow into our comfortable uh, studies or bedrooms uh, in London or, in my case, in Edinburgh. Richard has a way of letting the darkness creep in just when you're enjoying a charming poem which seems to be about something else entirely. And this one is called Someone Wrote a Book. Someone Wrote a Book called This Is Your Brain on Music that I've long been meaning to read but haven't got round to buying. Perhaps it's all to the good, brains being fickle that way. One moment in rapture, fingers making lists sound so easy, reeling you in. Then at the toll booth, buddy guy, not letting you through without good, sad reasons. Or waking with an earworm you wish had never seen the light of day. Yummy, 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 I've got love in my tummy. Remember that? I've read there was even music in the camps, choirs, orchestras, Glenn Miller for the inmates, Grieg and Mozart for the guards on Sunday afternoon. The programme was subject to change. Strings were cut, of course. The lineups varied. My own relationship with Germany is complicated, to say the least. My Jewish grandfather, born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1896, was called Adolf. There's a poem in that. But the poem I will read is about a certain longing I feel for Germany and all things German. This poem was sparked by Brexit and the news that many Jews in Britain who had fled or whose parents had fled Nazi Germany were planning to exercise their right of return to Germany. Germany was now a place of hope and enlightenment in comparison, at least, with Brexit Britain. At age 17, I spent a gap year in Berlin and gradually the poem became less and less about Brexit and more and more about my own sentimental attachment, trotz alledem, in spite of all that. And so this poem is called Auf Wiedersehen. The letters from your Litvak cousins lost. Their shoebox home fades blue to dusty grey in memory. But I recall the postmarks up to 1941 and how you wouldn't buy a Volkswagen. Could not forgive the folk who never knew. I know you felt a silent fury when I spent my gap year in Berlin. What was it? pulled me back into the pain. Oh, I wish you were here and we'd talk it through. A pebble on your grave, rest on. Forgive me when I go. I can be German again, not from the ashes in the birch wood, not from the acrid smoke, but from the shifting shadows of the smoke and the moving pools of sunlight wet on the clearing grass. I long to be German again, like a boatman entranced on the Rhine, not by the blonde who's combing her hair, but a song I can't shift from my head. Let me call this feeling 
Heimweh for something Heine said. I will be German again. Not with a veteran's iron cross, not with my Stammtisch and Stein, but alone in the past where my records spin, rescued from rupture of crystal and blood, played out by exile and loss. And when I return to my German home, I'll wear with pride the yellow patch and gently take the needle to the dusty groove, to the blue angel where the vine traubs play every night when Marlena sings from a disc in a darkened room. Now, if there's a poet anywhere in the world who's not written a poem about COVID, please step forward for a special award. Um, <laughs> I think Janice is volunteering, fantastic. Um, naturally, Richard has some COVID poems in this collection, but these are something out, out of the ordinary, poems of wit and wordplay, which take the piss out of the authorities' handling of the COVID crisis. And I want to read what, for me, is the loveliest and most succinct of these. This one's called Nearer. Life is nearer to the surface these days. Skins have thinned as well to be indoors. Words stripped back, shock and awe greet spring in mid stride. Blossoms now browning give way. We thank them all for their hard work. Uh, and I'm going to finish with what I think is the most relaxed poem in the book, and which for me perfectly captures the mixture of emotions and feelings on a lazy Sunday, at least in Richard Schwartz's Meshuggahner Cop. And this one's called Lazy. Towards the end of a lazy day, the weekend wind suddenly rose as if disturbed mid-sleep from a deep and strange dream, not bad, but far from sweet. Scenes vying for attention, none with any merit. Weekend wind taking time to shake them off. Settle back down, alert at last to this ragged Sunday's final few possibilities. Thank you very much. Please everybody unmute and give Richard and David a clap. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hello. Oh. Now suddenly I hear, I see people. <laughs> Lovely to see everybody. Um, okay, we'll have five minutes break if everybody's all right with that. Yes. Uh, and you can unmute and you can unmute chef. and just say hello to each other. You're much more. Time I'll go make there. my wife another cup of tea. <laughs> yes. Hello, Richard. <laughs> hey, Rich. Hey, Rich. Hey, Richard. <laughs> Hi, Richard. I'm there. He's trying to unmute himself. <laughs> I was worried it would get a bit cacophonous because everyone's going to want to say hello to everyone else. Well, I see Viola. Richard, Richard yeah. I sat in an office. Um, yeah. I sat in a small office with you for many years. You never, <laughs> ever read to me. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody is their lovely place. Richard, somebody, Richard Rose. Richard Ruder, you're in a beautiful place with the, with the sun out by the look of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're in, San, we're in San Diego. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's uh, not as warm as it looks at the moment. It's quite cold. Mm. <laughs> yeah. We'll be waiting for us to warm up. <laughs> no, no sympathy from Wisconsin, Richard, sorry. <laughs> 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 it's all relative it's all relative right all these suntans and everything oh <laughs> please bring on the summer <laughs> yes we've got we've got uh, very cold rather wet weather today very dull grumpy today weather, grumpy weather says donald yeah hello from australia 
from from warm city. Hey, Shelley. <laughs> Hello. Hello. What's the time there? It's What's about the six forty in the morning. Oh. I wouldn't miss it for quiz. Eight o'clock. It's it's. I'm corrected. It's seven o'clock. Oh, is it seven o'clock? Yeah, that doesn't, what doesn't matter. It's the morning. Well, you're from all over the world, so you've got to look to your own clocks. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's lovely. Eight o'clock in the UK. Shelley, you look very well on it. And thank you for writing your endorsement on the back of the book. Oh, it, it yeah. was a, it, it's a pleasure. And it was a very hard thing to do because I just wanted to, re, you know, re, sort of show all of them i wanted to actually just record every single beautiful word yes so yes. i loved them i really loved them yes right yeah. writing a i think we asked for 70 words writing 70 words can be harder actually than <laughs> writing a full review oh absolutely there's that old there's, there's the irish um poem I, I would have written a shorter letter but i didn't have enough time oh no no it was lovely what yeah it was fantastic thank you thank you thank you Oh, from Zimbabwe. Oh. <laughs> Am I? Yes. Sorry? Uh, sorry. I thought someone said Anne, and that sound um, popped up, but not me. <laughs> Shelley, how do you know Richard? Oh, me? from Zimbabwe. Yeah. Yes, from, from Habonim, from the Jewish youth movement. Ah. But he was always a Salisbury boy. Ah. <laughs> they were different, you know. <laughs> Big city boy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think Bulawayo is quite well represented here tonight. Though. I can see, yes. There's Kretz. I saw hey. Kretz. Hi, Kretz. Yeah. Hi, Gail and Dave. Hi, Shell. Hey. Hi, Rich. Hi, everybody. Hi, yeah. hi, hi. Yeah. Very John nice. Apple, of course, is styling in from Zimbabwe, from Bulawayo. And John oh, is here. Wow. John is here. I've just I've yep. just checked out. Hello, John Apple. You are here, aren't you? Despite the big time difference. Uh, yes, I am. I'm right here. So good of you to come. I passed my bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll get we'll start up again. Actually, so yep. because, you know, so it, it we don't want to make it too late for uh, or too early for everybody. So I'm going to talk about John Apple now. And John was born in South Africa in 1947. Uh, that makes you two years younger than me, John. John was raised in Zimbabwe, where he still lives. His first novel, D.G. Berry's The Great North Road, won the Mnet Prize and was listed in the Weekly Mail and Guardian as one of the best 20 South African books in English, published between 1948 and 1994. His second novel, Hatchings, was shortlisted for the Mnet Prize and was chosen for the series in the for the series in the Times Literary Sub Supplement of the most significant books to have come out of Africa. His other novels are The Giraffe Man, The Curse of the Ripe Tomato, The Holy Innocence, Absent, The English Teacher, Traffickings, and The Boy Who Loved Camping. His poetry collections include Spoils of War, which won the Ingrid Yonker Prize, Sonata von Matabele Land, Selected Poems, that was 1965 to 1995, Songs My Country Taught Me, O Suburbia, Landlocked, a winner of the International Poetry Business Prize, judged by Billy Collins, and Pressed Flowers, Poems of Resistance. Furthermore, he's collaborated with Filani Amadeus Nyoni in a collection called Hewn from Rock, and with Togara Muz Anenhamo in, uh, in a collection called Textures, which won the 2016 Noma Award for Outstanding Fiction Work. He's published three collections of poetry and short stories, The Caruso of Colleen Braun, White Man Crawling, and in collaboration with the late Julius Chingondo, Chingono, Together, which was nominated for the Pushcart Prize. Apple's short stories and poems have appeared in many anthologies, journeys, journals, and websites, including six poems in the Penguin Anthology of South African Poetry. 
His poem, Vendor and Child, was chosen by New Internationalist for their collection, Fire on in the Soul, the best human rights, 100 human rights poems from across the world over the last 100 years. In 2019, he was invited to participate in the African Writers' Festival in Berlin. He's now retired. He's taught English language and literature in secondary schools for 50 years. And his poem, Jasmine, I was so thrilled to see, was chosen as poem of the week in the British Guardian newspaper. It was published today and today's World Book Day. So of course I made a splash about it on Twitter for you uh, and Facebook. So thank you very much, John, for coming along and we're looking forward to hearing some poems from you, please. Well, thank you very much for um, that. Um, shall I start? Oh, yes, please do. I'm not very good at, at Zoom. Everybody else mute, I'd, please. I'd like to, um, I'd like to read uh, three sonnets um, in keeping with some of the themes tonight about growing old, um, but not unhappily growing old. Um, the first one is called Pied Crows. The floaters in my damaged eye transform, grow wings and soar into the other blue, catch thermals, ground gymnogenes, ride the storm, Determine what is false and what is true. Philosophers are crows that mess with me, upset my garbage, mock my human fears, disturb with ugly nests the beefwood tree, confound the Christmas beetles in my ears. To croak or not to croak, yes, be my guide as putrefaction seeps into the light. Words lie, will lie, words always lied. But you have substance, Fragments of the night. Now fold your wings, evacuate the sky, transform to floaters in my damaged eye. And the next one's called Drifting, another sonnet. A raven's bill cracks the shell of his sleep, picks away at the hubcap of his dreams, while water babies in the briny deep disperse like stars, like unoffending memes, fumbling for the tap in a box of wine, for the valve in a pair of bedtime shorts, lost babies floating on the serpentine, pied crows pecking at recollection's warts, the rook that fell into the fireplace, the cradle rocking that came tumbling down, all covered in soot, the dear little face, and the naughty boy Jack who broke his crown. At last the wine, the leak, dust motes sifting, cold water of darkness, drifting, drifting. And in the third sonnet, um, also on the theme of growing old, um, and um, yeah, it's also associated with COVID. Um, I, th I haven't got the title. Oh, it's called An Old Man's Lockdown Fantasy. He rang the devil's doorbell loud and long. Red polish on the doorstep lipped his shoes. The insects in his ears revived a song, a tintinabulation of the blues. The bats above, the worms below, the germ inside the socks, inside the shoes, inside the lungs. Ten toes too short to strum, to squirm, but fiddle, diddle, flexing, slip and slide, inactivate the percolating fleece. Ten fingers tapping out a rhapsody, a variation of old Nick's caprice. Ten knuckles knocking out a do-re-mi. He rings the devil's doorbell long and loud. The hinges creak, out wafts a twerking shroud. And then to end, I, I'd like to read a, a, a poem that I've written in the, in the ballad form. I, I'm kind of old fashioned with, with sticking to conventions. Um, okay, this is written in the ballad form and it's, it's called Charles Dickens Visits Bulawayo. 
He dragged his foot like the devil. He menstruated from his bum. He was Sykes and Nancy, evil and good, of opposites the sum. He dreamed of being a singer, an organ player in the church, a quasi covert bell ringer with a crow's angular lurch. Out of the wind, out of the grit, into the street splashed with urine, into the diarrheal shit, sanctimony larded with sin. My alter ego, John Jasper, did he butcher his nephew, Ned? Did I, God forgive me, murder my sister-in-law in her bed? In secret places moldering, her nightcap, camisoles, dresses. I took this lock of hair, this ring from her corpse, but what distresses me most, John, is that I died, my last words, on the ground before being committed to it. Don't you die like that. Shall we go sightseeing? I showed him the nests of weavers woven from wigs and extensions. I showed him cues of school leavers with disappointed intentions. I showed him rats like Dalmatians, Dalmatians like insects of stick. He said, of all my creations, Aunt Betsy Trotwood's the pick. Never be mean in anything, never be false, never cruel. Captain Cuttle begins to sing. Oliver begs for more gruel. He dreamed of being an actor, every man in his humor. I am Ellen's benefactor, Bobadil. The rest is rumor, John, rumor. You died on the job, you old goat. You came in your brain, clanging like the chain of Jacob Marley, shuddering like a train. I showed him the choking river, the child with expressionless eyes. I watched his white whiskers quiver, his distant winged white eyebrows rise. Your knowledge of Bulawayo is extensive and peculiar. And now, dear friend, I must go. It's all right to laugh, but don't jeer. My piles, all that blood, my sore leg, the opium makes it much worse. Let's part with a song, lovely peg. Stand by for the opening verse. Great. Do you have another one? You're very welcome to read more if you want. If you have another well, one to hand. I'll read, I'll read one more. Please okay. do. Please um, do. This one's from Textures. Uh, it's... Where's it, John? Okay, it's called A Suburban Night in August. The distant all-night drum, a dripping tap, a scops owl mimicking the creep of sap rising, Dombea's cream the bushy verge, a tilted southern cross returns the surge of hope in every hillside house. The world is waiting, trembling like a mouse, as you, unconscious of the cricket's rasp, in warm socks and striped pajamas, unclasp your hair, give it a tousle, set it free, smiling at him the way you smiled at me. That's enough. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. That was a lovely reading. I love the idea of Dickens having a chat with Dickens <laughs> in Bulawayo. It's brilliant. <laughs> Uh, what would he have made? He's one, of my he's one of my favorite authors, and I think he's influenced me a lot. His humor, I yeah. find him very funny. Yes, yes. I avoid his sentimentality, but his humor is great. Yeah. So, um, you, you and I kind proud of proud of you. Books over and over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. So now we're going to go back to Richard, and Richard, would you like to read us out then? And then after that, we'll have. Anybody who'd like to ask a question or say anything to Richard or John or David, um, be ready for that. So first of all, we're going to hear again from Richard Schwartz, please. I'm going to keep up the Zimbabwean theme. Uh, this, is a, this is called Zimbabwean Santo. And it's cheating a little bit because a Santo is a is a poem that's wholly composed of verses uh, and passage, passages taken from other poets, um, originally Homer and, and Virgil, but not in this case. So, so every line here is from another Zimbabwean poet. Uh, 
there's a line of Johns in here too, somewhere. A Zimbabwean Santo. Age has taken the blindfold off and the air is stilled by wood smoke, a sweet nose cleansing odor laden with promises. I am still hula hooping through decades that ran like rivers. The waters unleash their scything. I get tired of the blood. The ripples are huge. Your wounds will be named silence. I get tired of the blood, the granite surface of our days in the mountain mists of tumbling kingdoms. And while we're uh, uh, perhaps a little bit downbeat, I'm going to read a couple of poems that uh, we might, in the 70s, we'd have said they were heavy. Um, so so no, no humor here. Uh, this first one was written after watching a documentary made by Michael Kretzmer, who's on the, uh, who's in the call, um, about the town of Birge or Birge in, in Lithuania. Uh, highly recommend it if you, if you haven't seen it. And this is called We Have No Names. Broken days with care can often be repaired. Years are tough and decades tougher. Now we have no names. Names lost for mingled bones and forest graves, not far outside the village. For stones or walls, we have no names. No names for the fishmonger, teacher, cobbler or chemist. For the farmer, the market gardener, who will tend, who will scythe? Maybe we can make a plan while soil does its soft work. Melding, blending, borders fade to field grass, picnics in the sun, bread, fruit, honey. And the next one, uh, is called Uncompleted Kaddish. For those who don't know, Kaddish is a, is a Jewish memorial prayer that doesn't mention death. Um, and maybe the most famous Kaddish other than the Kaddish, uh, the prayer itself is Allen Ginsberg's Kaddish, uh, his, his uh, remembering of his late mother. And it's still available from City Lights Publishers, and I think every home should have one if you haven't got it. Um, anyway, Uncompleted Kaddish. Glorified and sanctified be his great name. Out, 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 throughout the world which he has created according to his will. We were shocked. May he establish his kingdom in your lifetime and during your days. We didn't know what was going on, where we are. And in the life of the entire house of Israel, soon, we saw only SS with dogs and let us say, Amen. And we saw in the distance symmetric lights. May his great name be blessed forever and to all eternity. Thousands of lights, blessed and praised, glorified and exalted. Out we came from these wagons, extolled and honored, adored and lauded, and we had to line up. The name of the Holy One, blessed be he, and there were people with striped uniforms beyond all the blessings and hymns. I asked one of them, where are we? Praises and consolations that are ever spoken in the world and let us say, Amen. Without looking at me, he said, may there be abundant peace from heaven and life for us, Auschwitz, and for all Israel. What is Auschwitz? And let us say, Amen. Um, 
I'm going to slowly try and take the mood a bit more upbeat now. Um, this is a poem that has some hope. It's called Restoration. Before this all started, I came across a bag of words, open, abandoned, as if thrown out in a strop, parts of speech chocked up willy-nilly, now spilling out for the world to trample. I've done what I can, knocked out dents, sanded down the scratches, wiped off sludge, picked the ingrained flecks of grit from cracks and corners, one or two expletives sadly past repair. I've hung them out again. Feel free to rummage. Some may come in handy to whomever. Salvage hunters, crazy hoarders, odd collectors, patience rewarded in our throwaway days. And this one celebrates the, the small things and it's called Glory Be. Most of the time, we're head down trying to get through the day when every now and then we pull up short before a miracle. This happens to us all, bakers, driving instructors, even young technicians in mid-sized towns with central fountains in need of some repair. A miracle checks our charted course. Yellow bug with golden wings and red trimming. Downfall of a brute. Cheese, most types and flavors. A certain single malt. Vase of flowers, buds just opened. The first waft of morning coffee for two. We give thanks to all these miracles in our own way. Some smile, some pray. Give thanks to each of these for suddenly existing, for drawing the sting from the next moment. And I've temporarily lost my place, but I'll find it soon. Um, this is called the music of trees. Not composed for human ears, diminuendo of mild winter, tone poem and dawn wind, crescendos avoided where possible, written, rewritten, performed at random, rarely repeated as well we know. Dogs can hear it though. They show appreciation moving tree to tree in their own time-honored way. And let's see. Yes, as David mentioned, COVID poems. Here's an explicitly COVID poem. Um, it's called Phrases That Have Recently Fallen Into Disuse. We've just run out of that, I'm afraid. Could you move up a little, please? It took ages to find a parking spot. Luckily, there was a cancellation. Do we really have to go tonight? If I am not for myself, who will be for me? And if I am only for myself, what am I? Try a sip of mine. And if not now, when? Great to see you, come in. Another glass? Mwah, mwah. Um, now, we're getting towards the end, I think. I've got a couple more. Um, the 
this one is called The Political Economy of Tango in the 21st Century. So I thought I should read that one. Percussionists thrive on patience, back of the orchestra waiting for a moment, passion for punctuation tingling in the bones. Not welcome in a Gardel tango, disrupting the flow with mallets and hi-hats, when all you want to know is how it played out. The ankles flick, cold smolder, everything that happened in the world today, the price of it all, the lasting effects to be determined, not yet important, well beyond the reach of melody. Um, and to finish, I'm going to read two poems. One is um, a new poem, or relatively recent, since the book was published. And one is uh, from my previous collection. This is the new poem. And it's called Credits. First of all, I owe a huge thank you to my vast volunteer army of synapses, neurons, cortices, and other support workers, too many to name, who made this journey possible for me with many thoughtful touches. It's been a thrill to stroll old streets, popping into haunts I'd once frequented, all familiar to a T. Uzo in Athens, Couscous in Marrakesh, September wines on Stanton Street, down from Russ and Daughters, whose bagels and fish spreads are frankly to die for. They've even found old drive-ins with crappy speakers, soggy chips and Fanta, record shops, racks of vinyl inviting discovery, gum trees for shade, balancing rocks. I'm in awe of their efforts. Last but not least, a shout out to the old brain for taking charge, keeping the show on the road and managing the whole shebang. Once or twice, I've doubted your advice, but I've got to admit, you do know what I like. It's really quite uncanny. And now to finish, uh, this is a poem from, from my previous collection um, a very difficult poem to submit to competitions because usually in poetry competitions you can't put your name on the on the poem you can't be identified so, so I had to publish it to get it out there um, and it's called Not That Richard Schwartz and it's also uh, probably the longest poem I've ever written I'm not the IT consultant in Nashua, New Hampshire, who has his own blog. I'm not the math professor at University of Maryland. I'm not the one who wrote Judaism and vegetarianism. I'm not the fire and explosion investigator in Davie, Florida. I'm not the NASA scientist who specializes in imaging spectroscopy. I'm not the promising Californian quarterback. I'm not the New York Daily News columnist who thinks subway and city bus riders get a raw deal. I know nothing about the regulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines, though one of us does. I never ran the Palmer House Hotel in Sauk Center, Minnesota. My knowledge of finite element analysis as it pertains to mirrors is laughably inadequate. I was never invited to testify before the Committee on Education and the Workforce on behalf of the American Iron and Steel Institute, which is just as well, really. I'm not the president, CEO, and founder of Solo Mio in Austin, Texas. Was never in charge of New York State's part in the Microsoft antitrust action. I'm not the cantor at Congregation Tiferet Yaakov, Manhattan Beach, California. I'm not the one with a neurosurgery practice in Salt Lake City. If you were attracted by the religious appreciation night at Rex's innkeeper in Warnakee, 
with a menu of chicken, pork, mashed potatoes, gravy, dressing, two salads, rolls, coffee, milk, and dessert for $16 a head. I was not the one to call. I'm not the former mayor of Hannibal, Missouri. I'm not the assistant pastor of Grace Presbyterian Church of Peoria, Illinois. I'm not the Australian fan of Spellbinder. I'm not the accountant in Pennsylvania specializing in partnership taxation. I'm not the one who wrote the Mazda car repair manual. I'm the other one. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, thank you, Richard. That last one really, really hits the spot with me because I've been trying to find you on Twitter and I can't. I found all those other people. Yeah. Same on Facebook. <laughs> There's only one Richard Schwartz. Well, oh, yes. Well, that was great. Thank you 60, very much. 60,000 Richard Schwartz fans can't be wrong. So, we certainly went from... from um, a very sad beginning to a very <laughs> funny end. From the sublime to the sublime. Yes, with, from yes, the I nearly said to the, the ridiculous. from the sublime to the ridiculous, but it wasn't like that, was it? Brilliant, anyway. There um, used to be a. Um, very stuck. I don't know if it still exists. But there used to be a. a uh, I don't know if it was an app. It was before the days of apps, but a site called Googleism. <laughs> you could put in your name and it would automatically search all the other people with your name <laughs> and give you the first line of, of, of what it said about them. And, and, uh, oh, father, a surprisingly large number of Richard Schwartz's. <laughs> you would have had to cheat to make it, put it into a competition, call yourself something else, wouldn't you? Anyway, that was brilliant. We ought to give you a clap and Richard as well. Yes. Uh, uh, John Apple as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, um, would anybody like to ask anybody questions? If if not, don't worry about it. We'll we can. Uh, we've got time though. If you would like to, if anyone one would like to ask anything or talk, say anything. Can I ask a question? Yes, indeed. Richard, I've always been intrigued by the form of your poetry. You want to talk about that? Um, yeah, thanks. Good. Nice question, Dave, because you can't actually see the, the form. I'm, um, I'm not, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I don't feel confined to existing poetic form. And I know there's a strong argument for using form as a discipline for what you want to say. And, and John uh, is very, very good at that. But I'm more uh, attracted to the shape of poem. So when I'm writing, I, I sort of, I want them to look visually interesting. Not necessarily, sometimes they reflect what I'm, what I'm saying and sometimes not. It's not concrete poetry in the sense of being, you know, poems that are designed to, to fit a particular shape. But shape is an important motivator for me. So sometimes if I'm writing, if a line's too long, I'll find a, a synonym to make the line shorter. So I do kind of play with shape as, as part of, uh, of the exercise. It looks like the book, it, the poems in here look like a, a collection of Greek urns, actually. There are a lot of pot shapes. Um, it's quite possible that I was inspired by Greek urns during my time in Greece. <laughs> and I think it was John Apple that wrote that these mostly dove shaped poems, which I thought was lovely, a lovely line. Um, dove shaped, they are very, um, well, then none of them is dove shaped, actually, but they're, they're very peaceful. You can't see them, can you? Yes, you can. Yeah, I can. Yes. Mm. So you'll have to buy the book, oh, everybody. The book is available now from, well, it's available from us, but it's also available from Richard's new website. Um, so you can very easily buy it from Richard wherever you are in the world. 
we're not we're not selling uh, internationally we've still got we've got it on our website as well dempseyandwindle.com but anyway anybody else like to ask anything or say anything thing about getting it from the author is that you can get an autographed copy of course oh yes if you send... we can't do that we can forge his yes. signature but that's not the same yeah, no, it's not quite the same I no, think that's not know. the Richard Schwartz that's just order yes if you order it from Richard you will you will uh, of course if you want it you'll get a signature inside which is which makes it worth twice the much twice as much at least so um I think uh, at least one person who's here tonight did say he wanted a, a signed copy so I'm sure he'll be in touch Richard would you like to write your you know there's a chat thing at the bottom okay if you like to write your website address in that sure. and anyone who's interested can get in touch um i've just noticed a question in the yeah. chat actually oh yeah. right yes so i see it now hi richard our, our mic macbook mic is shoddy but a question from josie so i've noticed the popularity and spotlighting of zimbabwean and zimbabwean diaspora wow. fiction recently um house of stone and titi dambarengwa's trilogy etc has there been a parallel uptake of zimbabwean poetry um i think that's a question i'd have to direct to john mm. if, uh... um yes um I, this country is suffering in so many ways you know there's more than 90 percent unemployment um it's it's we're in a bad way but somehow Somehow it's 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 um, had this ironical um, injection of creativity. Maybe it's not ironical. Maybe that's when when you do get creativity. When there's when there's you know. How are you coping, John? I'm, I'm very lucky because I have children who look after me. I have a oh. son in London who sends me money, and I've. Oh, that's good. Although I'm retired, I've got a part time teaching job yes. at Guild College and I get a bit of you know that pays my bills so I'm, I'm very comfortable and my daughter's here and she oh that's good since we've been in lockdown because you she, went you went to school with my husband you went to Guinea Fowl with Peter Martindale and I went to Milton oh did you go to Milton oh mate that's where Pete um oh because he says he met you through rugby or something yeah, I might have played rugby against him. It was pretty tough playing rugby in Guinea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. might have been on the rugby field. Um, yeah, so um, yes, and I, you know the amazing thing is that you you mentioned um, Norvoya Rosa Tuma and uh, Tutsi Dangaremga, but at Girls College here in Bulawayo, um, recently um, there are four ex-girls college girls who are internationally known writers now yeah. and um and and um it's wonderful and i went to berlin last year three, three of them were there. there's one called sunyati and um um Spiwe and lovu and bryony ream bryony ream is a bit older and they all come from that same school in bulawayo all four novelists mm. And poetry is booming, especially um, um, open mic poetry, you know, sort of, what, is, what do they call it? Um, um, spoken word. Yeah, spoken word. That's very popular. And um, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's thriving. Oh, that's uh, good. Despite all the misery that's surrounding us. There's another question in the, in the chat. Um, Hi, Richard. Wendy, same family as last question. Why do I race through novels I enjoy, but need to slow down and say, savour poetry? Have you got any thoughts on that? Oh, um, I think poetry is designed to slow you down. Mm. Um, you're not trying to get anywhere with a poem, I think. Mm. A novel's whole purpose is to drive you on. And if it's a successful novel, to drive you on faster and faster, even though obviously there are, are passages that um, uh, you can enjoy um, and savour. But, but I, I'd say that's 
novels are designed to speed you up and poems are designed to slow you down. I guess that's how I would put it. Yeah. I think a novel is an autobahn and uh, poetry is speed bumps. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just realized I put the wrong address, so I'm, I'm, I'm adding another one. Um, yes, Richard's putting his email address in. R.D.S. Schwartz. It's, it's R. Yeah, I, I, first I put Richard Schwartz at weebly.com, and I got to some um, executive coaching. <laughs> it was one of your that, many doppelgangers. Yeah. <laughs> R.D.S. Schwartz. R.D. Schwartz. R.D. Schwartz, I think it is. Dot Weebly.com. Dot Weebly. That's two E's in Weebly.com. So that's where you get a signed copy. That's correct. Yep. It's in the chat now. Ben Diamond is asking, Richard, do you feel your memories of early life have faded or have become or have come more into focus and made sense of? as you've gotten older? That's a great question. I would say both. Um, some things, obviously, I think my memory has become more selective. I don't know if it's a kind of memory version of survival of the fittest, but <laughs> some things I remember really well from, or I don't know if I remember them, but I've constructed in my head this image of what happened that looks remarkably like what I believe happened, but it may or may not be. Um, and some things have disappeared, you know, that I, they're, they're probably there. I, I don't think if you ever sweep the bottom of your brain. So there's all this kind of detritus lying about on the floor. And occasionally you, you, you come across something that you thought had, had disappeared, but, um, both. You, you can, you can yeah. construct something new out of some of it, I should think. Yes, yes, absolutely. Mm. Um, like any rubbish. Sometimes you remember, you don't necessarily remember what happened in a sort of way you can record, but you remember certain feelings or certain atmospheres and you build around, you build your memories around them mm. or you reconstruct them maybe. Yeah. I think that Memory is an amalgam. It's sort of something that falls down the back of the couch. And you do find that pound, but there is a, a toffee stuck to it and a piece of fluff. And, you know, I yeah. think that's how memory is constructed. Yeah. Mm. Exactly. However, you do remember the lyrics of every song you've ever known. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's because, I, I mean, my theory is that's because it rhymes and it's got rhythm and that's what rhyming poetry is for, to be kept in the memory, isn't it? Mm. Do you think? But I also remember things I don't, you know, when it comes to songs, as the one poem that, that David read out indicated, there are things I remember that I would rather <laughs> not remember. <laughs> like, yummy, 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 I've got love in my tummy. <laughs> love in my tummy, yeah. I feel like loving you. <laughs> yes. Let's give that man a guitar. <laughs> Have you got a guitar, Richard, there? <laughs> Under the bed, maybe. I, I do, actually. But, oh, you uh, do? It's going to stay <laughs> <up>. yeah. <laughs> Quite a few. Guitars, <laughs> and, uh, mandolin. Ah. <laughs> so, There's wait. another question, Richard. Yeah. Um, from... Uh, can you talk about your taste in music? Um, I was going to ask this. Hmm. That's also got a lot to do with memory. So my my what I think of as my taste in music is not necessarily what I listen to. So these days I tend to listen mostly to classical music. Um, but what I think of as my taste in music is Leonard Cohen, Bob Dylan, Van Morrison, and uh, other kind of singer-songwriters of, uh, of that ilk, and jazz. So um, I don't think that when, I, when, I, when I'm playing music, um, 
I guess I'm mostly inspired by Leonard Cohen and Bob Dylan. Um, but uh, I don't think it has an impact on my, it doesn't inspire my poetry so much. Um, I think it's a very difficult question to answer because as soon as I start talking about my taste in music, I think of other things that I think, oh, I really like that. And, um, and I don't mention it and, uh, and that could go go on and on with that. So I'll, I'll leave it at that, I think. <laughs> Can I just say, um, Richard, that I am so touched and privileged actually to have been invited to this reading. It's just been really a wonderful experience. I mean, I could have written that in the chat, but I kind of wanted to say it to your face. Thanks, Tamar. Thank you. Nice. Nice to see you. Hi, thanks, <laughs> Frank. Yeah. Um, I've got a, like an observation, which I don't know if I can express it very uh, clearly. But, you know, as I've got older, I find that I'm becoming more and more selective about the novels I'll read, the poetry I'll, I'll read, the music I'll listen to. Um, because I've become very sensitive to two dark sort of um, subjects. Mm -hmm. And I'm always amazed by your poetry that your gentle personality <laughs> sort of is your introduction. And then somewhere like I'm slip, I slip down sort of, you know, this little hole together with you. <laughs> and I just wonder if that is something that um, uh, it just happens while you're writing and it's part of your, your style without being aware of it. Because like every time I think to myself, oh, shit, he's taken me there again. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gail, that's an excellent question. And to some extent, there is... Uh, a method in that. So Billy Collins, again, to quote, uh, was one of my favorite poets, said, when you start a poem, you have to open the door and welcome people in. And then you can always close the door and lock it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. good. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. I loved everything tonight, Richard, except the reference to yummy, yummy, yummy. I got love oh, in my tummy. It'll take right me now, days to lose that. <laughs> you bastard. He's not kidding, you know. <laughs> Donald gets earworms, and I have to yeah. put up with them too because he hums them all the time. <laughs> yeah, but it's like the not orchestra or something like well. that. <laughs> no, well, I just want to say how glad I am that Richard has finally had some. Uh, challenges with his fo with his follicles. <laughs> oh. Follicles, I had a few, but then again, so few. <laughs> that's that's the year of egrets. I've had a few. <laughs> the Twitcher song. <laughs> Well, it's been it's been a lovely evening. It's so nice to see so many people in part. Thank you, Richard. And relaxing. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. You. Thank you too. And particularly Please. to Richard and David and John, John Apple, wonderful poetry. Thank you yes, very delightful. much. Yes. And yeah. uh, John, you're able to um, get a bit of sleep now if you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. It really Lovely has. To meet Thank you. you so much. Well done, Thanks. Richard. You're a star. You're Thanks. Right. Thanks, Trump.